All right, folks. Uh, those were able to make it here. Uh, thank you for coming. I know the weather is not cooperating with us this week, so uh, we will do our best here. All right, so uh, today we're talking about uh, week five. Uh, that is applying debate technique to argument. Okay, so uh, what we're basically talking about here is uh, what kind of techniques from uh, verbal debate can be applied to writing uh, an argument essay for a written debate. So the agenda for today is we're going to go through this quickly. Uh, we'll take some questions here, uh, and then I want to address some concerns that folks have been uh, telling me about uh, that they have in regards to the classical argument assignment. Okay. Uh, just before we get too far into this, just want to make sure that we have established that uh, the deadline for this assignment has extended a week because a lot of people are still having issues with connectivity, issues with power supply, uh, issues with the weather in general. Okay, so uh, you guys are going to have an extra week to turn this essay in. All right, so what is debate? <clears throat> you may have a passing familiarity with debating from political debates where candidates make the case for their election. <clears throat> That's where most people get exposure to it. Uh, debate typically is a performative form of argument where oratory skills become equally as important as the point you're making and the logic you bring to bear for your argument. So debaters are still reliant on the main appeals, uh, what you're used to, the pathos, ethos, and logos. They're just as dependent on those as writers of written arguments. Uh, however, and they're also still just as prone to logical fallacies. It's just that debaters have a tendency to have to think on their feet. By looking at how debates work, some of the elements can be applied to parts of any argument essay. We're going to take a look first at how the uh, formal debate is supposed to work, not how it typically works in the modern time. All right? So we're going to start off with the structure of debate, okay? Debating has a particular structure for how topics are chosen and arguments are cited. Uh, basic structure goes like this. There's a topic that's chosen called a res resolution or a motion. In the case of the classical arguments and most other written forms, this would be the premise of the argument. Uh, second, teams argue affirmative and negative. In debate competitions, it's usually determined by a coin flip. So there's no guarantee you'll be able to you'll agree with the side you wind up on, but you will still have to argue on its behalf. Okay. Uh, teams have an hour to prepare and speak for set time limits per member. Typically, a debate's going to run in three rounds. Speakers alternate between sides, but the affirmative side always goes first. The affirmative side has the advantage of presenting their side of the argument first. The negative side always has the advantage of being the last the last word. Okay. The audience that debaters are primarily tailoring, tailoring their arguments toward is the debate judge. While the judge is supposed to be solely judged the quality of the arguments made, inherent biases may come into play. So have to keep in mind who your judge is and uh, what they may have uh, previously done, what kind of uh, biases they may con currently hold. <laughs> because the teams are usually made up of three speakers for each side, there's a particular role and order for each member of the team. So, uh, starting off, first affirmative. The first affirmative speaker contextualizes, the team, sets out the team's interpretation, defines terminology if necessary, and outlines the argument and the team split, who will deliver which reasoning, and then provides two or three arguments supporting the motion. The first negative recontextualizes the debate as a rebuttal to affirmative, including differing definitions, outlines the argument and the team split. So again, they will tell who's going to be giving which part of the argument. Rebut the argument made by first affirmative, and then provide two to three arguments opposing the motion. Seconds for each team, we're going to rebut the previous speaker, clarify definitional issues, and deliver two to three more arguments. The thirds for each team specifically rebut the seconds, specifically respond to attacks of the opposition, and conclude with a brief summary of their team's argument and reasoning. Okay. Now, how do we apply this to written? Okay. Each of the members of the debate team is producing their own short argument of essay and presenting it orally, but if we look at it holistically, they're all each, they're each presenting a certain element 
of the argument. Okay, the first are presenting the background for the argument and its bigger picture meaning. Although there is a bit of dispute that takes place between them, it also emphasizes the differences between the sides. So they're giving you the background information. They're telling you why it's important. They're telling why why it's important that one side or the other prevails. The seconds are presenting organized arguments to support the team's main premise, using logical reasoning and evidence to support the premise. They are also rebutting the opposition using logical reasoning and evidence. Okay, so this is the the seconds are basically acting as the body. Okay, they are giving you the meat of the argument, what the reasonings are for the argument, and the evidence that supports those reasons. The thirds are offering the fullest rebuttal possible to the opposition while also concluding their team's argument with a brief summary and overview. It would also be their job to offer the parting shot the conclusions call for to convince the audience to keep the argument in mind. That's especially true of the third negative because they have the last word. Okay. Then we have basic debate argument structure. Uh, this is the very basic structure that debaters use. It's also highly helpful for writers, okay? Breaks down into three sections, claim, evidence, and impact. The claim pres presents the argument in a clear manner with a clear statement. The evidence are the facts supporting the claim, including statistics, references, quotes, and so on. The impact is what significance each piece of evidence has for the claim, okay? The claim in this case to be equivalent to reasons for supporting a side of an argument. Thus, this structure could be used for each part of an argument essay and offer a logical backing for the ideas presented. Okay. Then we have rebuttal. In a debate setting, rebuttal is typically limited to pointing out the logical shortcomings of the opposition and how claims may not hold up to tighter scrutiny. Okay. So instead of focusing on why the argument is wrong, you're, you're focusing on why the argument is argued wrong. Uh, why there is logical problems with the conclusion that the opposition has reached, okay? The most typical fallacies present in competitive debates are similar to ones that appear in written arguments as well. Uh, take a look at a few of these. False dichotomy, which is the either-or fallacy, splitting into a two-sided issue. Assertion, statements that are knocked back by evidence are typically assumptions, Okay. Uh, morally flawed, statements and arguments that are questionable in their distribution of fairness and or morality. That's something that feels inherently wrong on a moral level. Correlation versus causation. Just because it rains every time Mary comes to a picnic doesn't mean we don't invite Mary to the picnic. Okay. Uh, failure to deliver promises. Speakers promised evidence they've not produced. Okay. Uh, straw man, you're creating a false, exaggerated version of the opposition that's easier to attack. Uh, contradiction, presenting two conflicting arguments that cancel each other out, thus reducing the side's credibility. Uh, and then finally, compare the conclusion to reality. The conclusion presented is oversimplified and may have further complications if put into effect. Okay. Uh, I didn't mention this in the in the video lecture, but there is a good example of this. Uh, an entire movie that actually falls into this compare the conclusion to reality fallacy. Uh, if you're familiar with the film Bruce Almighty, just about every decision that the Jim Carrey character makes while he has basically the power of God uh, is comparing the conclusion to reality fallacy because he's uh, shifting, shifting stuff so that uh, it works, uh, but he's not taking into account the uh, consequences of what would happen if he did everything. In this case, it's answering everybody's prayers with yes. Uh, and eventually what what this leads to is, yeah, he gets what he wants, which is to be the local anchor at TV station. Uh, that's the ultimate goal that he has. But over the course of this, he has messed up the tides of the world by pulling the moon closer to the earth when he wanted to set a romantic scene for his girlfriend. Uh, he has caused chaos and rioting for two separate reasons. One, because people are angry that everybody uh, won the, picked all six numbers in the lottery and the prize amounted to, divided among everybody, amounted to about 35 cents. It also, uh, this place, it takes place in Buffalo, so there's also a happy riot going on because uh, he answered yes to the prayers of uh, everybody who wanted the Buffalo Sabres to win the Stanley Cup. So, He's not taking into account that there are consequences to everything that he grants, uh, and he basically leaves the city of Buffalo in utter chaos, okay? 
<clears throat> so that's something to think about when you talk about comparing the conclusion to reality. Okay. All right. Then we have important skills for debating. For a debater to be successful, there's some elements that need to be present in their argument. For the purpose of writing arguments, though, this comes down to these uh, key items that you want to keep in mind as you are writing. Okay? Uh, when you're making points, make the points relevant to the topic. Okay? Uh, provide evidence when you can, not just your own personal opinion. If you can have fact to back up your reasons, all the better. Remain objective when arguing. Passionate arguments can become illogical, so control your emotions. Uh, don't let your emotional side get the better of you. Everything has to make sense, the logical sense. Consider the audience's attention span. They're not going to want to sit through a hugely uh, complex and long argument. Okay. Use pathos, ethos, and logos to support your rhetoric. Okay. Employ comparative thinking. How would things be different if the opposition wins or status quo remains versus if you win? Okay, so what's going to change? What's going to make a difference here? How are things going to be better or worse depending on who wins? Uh, keep your language simple. Make sure people understand you. Avoid hyperbole. Don't use terms like always or never. Don't say this is the biggest thing, this is the biggest tragedy, this is the greatest accomplishment, so on and so forth. Okay. Avoid fallacious argument techniques. Uh, this includes falsifying data or evidence. Make sure all of your data and evidence is factual and can be confirmed and is taking the full, full picture in account. Attacking the arguer for the opposition rather than the opposing argument. This is the ad hominem fallacy, attacking the man instead of attacking the argument. <laughs> Uh, disagreeing with facts or obvious truths. There is no such thing as alternative facts, okay? No matter what some people would have you think, there is no such thing as alternative facts. <clears throat> and we have some, add some examples of debating that we had in the video, okay? Uh, I'm not going to play them here because it's going to be too long to get into in this session, uh, but we're looking at the 1960 presidential debate between Kennedy and Nixon, the first the first debate uh, that was televised nationally. Uh, then we have the, the debate highlights from several campaigns, uh, 76, Ford versus Carter, 84, Reagan Mondale, uh, 88, Benson Quayle, 88, Bush Sr. versus Dukakis, uh, 92, Gore versus Quayle versus Stockdale, uh, 2008, Biden versus Palin. And then we had the uh, highlights from the the uh, scene from the 2009 British House of Commons debate uh, uh, between Gordon Brown and David Cameron when Brown was the Prime Minister. Okay, uh, so uh, so those were the, those were the examples that I gave you of debate. All right, all right. So that that covers it for those slides. Uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions here. Uh, and then we'll talk about the concerns folks have about the uh, uh, current essay that's uh, coming up. Okay, so uh, if you have questions, go ahead, raise your hand, and let me know you're there. Uh, and let me have a question.
All right, if there's no questions here, I did want to try to address some issues that uh, folks have been uh, emailing me for the, for the uh, week thus far, okay? Uh, so first off, there, I did have some questions in regards to, uh, at this point, people are still trying to figure out subject matter, okay, for the classical argument. Uh, here's, here's the thing. The problem that I'm finding is that there's, I have a lot of students who uh, want guidance on uh, subject matter that I really don't want to give, okay? Uh, it's not because I can't give it. It's because I want you guys to come up with your own topics, okay? That's half of the assignment here is finding your subject matter. Now, I do realize that there are a lot of classes where people have, in the past, They've had uh, instructors who have given them their topics and said, you have to write on this. Uh, I, I myself I found that to be extremely limiting uh, because typically the only thing that they're asking you to write on is something that's going to regurgitate their opinion to you, to them, so that you, you basically uh, are parroting what they have to say about the topic. And that's what I don't want, okay? So... What I, what I want you guys to do as far as subject matter goes is I want you to find your own. Uh, that's why I said when I gave the assignment, look in current events. Look for uh, news stories where there is a dispute. And you can take one side or the other. And that's what you're going to be basing your argument on is whether you are uh, – how you can prove one side or the other – is the right side and the, and the reasoning you have for falling on that side. Okay. So, first off, I hope that clarifies that, if anybody had any uh, concerns about subject matter, okay, and why I, ha why I haven't uh, given you a subject matter. Uh, as I've told some, some people who have written about this, the only time I give you a topic is for the final exam because I've got the research materials you need for it. I'm still going to be asking you to make your own choices as far as uh, how you're going to approach it, Okay. <laughs> So, that out of the way, uh, the other, another thing I've had concerns about was I've had a few people saying I'm not going to make the deadline, I have no power, I'm having trouble with signals and stuff like that. Uh, I completely understand that. Uh, I did mention yesterday that I had lost power here. Uh, they, got us ba they got us back online about an hour, almost immediately after I sent, sent out that announcement. Uh, it's been on since here, so uh, I'm still uh, powering out, powering along here. However, I do understand that there are still people doing rolling blackouts. There are still some people who have not had power restored yet, <clears throat> and as such, that's going to affect whether they can do the assignments or not. Uh, as a result of that, I did decide that I was going to extend this assignment for one extra week. 
Okay, so uh, you your new uh, due date for this assignment is next Friday, which would be February 26th. Okay, uh, assignment will be due at midnight. Okay, and uh, going from there is where I'll start. Uh, a week after that. You're, you still have a grace period of one week after that date to get it in. After that, I'll start. Uh, I'll start uh, incurring penalties. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you take a look at the calendar, one week after the 26th is going to be the 5th of March. So that's going to be the latest you can turn it in with no penalty. Okay. All right. Now another question I had people asking about was where to turn it in. <laughs> okay, I want to establish here that link does not go live until tomorrow. Okay, uh, I do that intentionally because uh, since the original due date was was going to be Friday, uh, that was going to force you to have to do more workshopping. Okay, this week was supposed to be proofing and editing workshops, so. Uh, that you could polish up the papers before you turn them in so that you make sure that they were the best possible. I've had too many people who have turned in essays like immediately as soon as the link went active, uh, when I've had the link activate the start of the week, and what they basically turned into me was a paper that had not been proofread, uh, and as such, they were just in a rush to turn it in, and as such, they they suffered for it because uh, there were spelling errors, there were typos, there were uh, uh, organizational issues. Uh, a lot of these, again, uh, one of my big pet peeves is uh, papers that are missing paragraph breaks. A uh, number of these essays have, have been turned in like way early were typically ones that were a single paragraph that stretched across four pages. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I give you that time before it goes live so that you have the opportunity to fix that before you turn it in. Okay. It kind of forces you to do that. So if you're looking for the link, uh, it will go live tomorrow. Okay. I can show you where it is uh, so that you have an idea of where to look uh, when it comes down to uh, tomorrow. All right, let me bring up the tab. There it is. <clears throat> All right, so here is the uh, home page. Okay, uh, you're seeing my view, that's why you're going to be able to see this link. Uh, currently, some of the stuff that I can see, you can't. Okay. But where you're going to find the link, it's going to be under major essays slash assignments. Okay. Uh, it'll be under argument one. And when you scroll down here, uh, there will be a link that says essay number one, classical argument essay. Okay. Uh, you know, it's grayed out here. Uh, right now it's grayed out because it is currently not available. To you. Okay. Uh, it will be made available at midnight. So if you if your your essay is burning a hole in your laptop, it, you will be able to turn it in at that time. Okay. Uh, this is the stuff that you have to ensure that your file meets before you turn it in. First off, it has to be an acceptable file format. <laughs> the only file formats that are that uh, eCampus accepts are .doc, .docx, .pdf, or .rtf. Okay. For text documents, those are the only formats you can use. Anything else comes up as illegible garbage. Okay, uh, that includes uh, documents that may use the extension .pages. Uh, .pages is an extension that is exclusive to Google, uh, and the only thing that can read that is Google's version of Word. Okay, uh, eCampus brings it up as machine la machine language garbage. Okay, so. Uh, you're, before you turn it in, if you're working with, uh, if you're working with Google files, uh, you're going to need to convert those to an acceptable format. Uh, the most common that, po that people use are the Word document, the Word, uh, Microsoft Word, uh, file formats, which are .doc or .docx. A file should contain all three drafts of the essay in the following order. 
Uh, first thing you should see when you open it up is the final draft with your Works Cited page. Uh, following that is the proofing draft that you should be working with, uh, should have been working with this week and next week. I'll extend that to next week as well, uh, where it should be the draft that you're showing to your group, to your teams. And then following that is the revision draft, which is your first draft that you showed to your teams. Okay? Yeah, say it here's the requirements listed in week two slides. Uh, that is to say it, it meets the page length, it meets the font size, font face, uh, the requirements for a number of sources, uh, MLA formatting, and make sure that the essay has been workshopped in your teams twice. One time for revisions and one time for proofreading and editing. Okay? The, again, that link will go live tomorrow at mid, uh, it go, actually goes live at midnight. So you will be able to uh, use it. All right. So that that covers all of the questions that I've been receiving thus far uh, about the uh, classical argument. Now, again, uh, just as a reminder, you do have an extra week to work on this uh, because I know a lot of people have had uh, issues with power and issues with weather and issues with uh, internet. Okay, so. Uh, if you're one of those that's having issues, you have an extra week to work on this, okay? Uh, I'll, let me open it up to any other qu questions or concerns that folks may have about this essay, okay? All right. Uh, so let's let's open it up again. Are there any other questions anybody may have about any other aspects of the class right now? Uh, any other concerns that you may have?
All right, folks. Uh, I won't tie you up too much longer here. Uh, I know a lot. I know a lot of people have uh, concerns in regards to power, uh, communication, things like that. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, cut things off here. Uh, for those of you who did make it here, thanks for coming by. Uh, the uh, lecture next week is going to start getting into the uh, lecture next week is going to start getting into the uh, uh, evaluative. Uh, essay, and uh, we'll be uh, talking about what what to expect with evaluation and uh, exactly what we're going to be uh, doing as far as that essay goes. Okay, so uh, we'll do another one of these sessions next week. Hopefully, more people will be able to show up. Hopefully, the weather will cooperate and uh, more people will be able to get on. Uh, and uh, till then, I'll see you guys then. Uh, thanks for coming by.